It's nice to meet you all, I have to say. So the topic today I'm going to talk about is a third molar surgery and nerve injury. Um, from a dent dentist perspective, uh, this is something I've been working for many years since the day I graduated. It has been a very important topic, especially nowadays uh, patients know know more and they know their rights and also sometimes they, they are not happy with the result. They may sue. So as dentists, uh, as surgeons, um, how can we protect ourselves? How can we make give the best um, uh, opinion uh, clinical decisions to our to our patients while not uh, making them unhappy is very important. So coming one year, one hour, I'm going to talk about this and uh, we have a and a sessions afterwards and hopefully uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have some information and fun tonight. Okay, okay so first of all, uh, I'm from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, our school has been ranked world number one for three years. Uh, but of course, for the past two years, we have ranked number four. If you like to watch football, you know these things goes up and down and we don't care too much about it. But we have been proud that we, we have been uh, winning and like Liverpool, we may come back again. Uh, and the photo, I believe, is the, um, is the Department of Oral and Maxillary Surgery uh, and many of our trainees um, are like still training here and I'm doing mostly the uh, maxillofacial stuff relating to benign pathologies, uh, TMJs, orthonavic surgeries. Uh, Dr. Richard Su, the one on the left on the photo, is doing most of the reconstruction and oncology. I have to uh, say um, even though as an academia, I am spending maybe 80 to 90 percent of, of my time still practicing uh, clinical work. I do a lot of, most of my research still on clinical work and um, that's the, where my interest is. But of course, uh, as, a, and as an academia, I have to publish, I have to research and I have to do a lot more things like, uh, for example, speaking on TV is also part of my job as a, a staff in the university. Uh, so apart from what I'm going to talk about tonight, on nerve injuries and third molars. Uh, most, many of my work are on orthonavic jaw correction surgeries. Uh, and that is my big interest because I can make people bite better and look better. And I'm also doing a lot of TMJ surgeries. Uh, most of them hopefully don't need surgeries, but uh, I do do some of these. And also a lot of the benign pathologies. So knowing more about myself, for those who don't know me, I am a very keen football player. I played a lot uh, when I was young. And I see some of my teammates also attending this lecture. Uh, nice to meet you all, all here. And this keeps me energetic and uh, physically fit as well. I'm also uh, learning to do sailing. Uh, the first thing you go on to a very cool boat is to ask someone to take a picture like this to make you look cool, uh, but I'm still actually learning how to sail. I have two monkeys at home and they are growing. They are Luca and Levia, eight and five years old. Uh, luckily they are sleeping, so you won't see them tonight, hopefully. So going to tonight's uh, topic, uh, we all see patients with third molar surgery. It's so common. People have uh, done some research, at least 70 to 80% of these teeth has to be removed or they will cause some pathologies. And a lot of these will cause um, pain or like periodontal disease, pericoronitis, and they come to see us as dentists. And for like this gentleman coming to see you with a swollen face, swollen gum, and a partially uh, impacted tooth, what will you do? If that tooth you take an x-ray and it comes out to be like this, you will know that, oh wow, I won't have a very easy life because it lies exactly on the nerve and you start to worry because that, that tooth has to go, the patient is in pain, shall I do it or shall I not do it? What should I do? Because I know if I take it out, you are going to cut the nerve or at least have some damage to the nerve. That is the big worry to yourself as well as to the patients. What will we do? So this lecture is a lot of Q&A in this lecture. Throughout this lecture, it's all about questions and hopefully some answers. And I'm going to try to ask some questions 
that are relevant to the third molar surgery and nerve injury that are of great clinical relevance. They are not purely on research, they are of great clinical relevance. And commonly asked by dentists or even patients every day. And I'll try to answer them with an evidence-based approach, with some evidence that is supported by research. Dentist application is the most important. Like all the research I'm doing, I try to answer some clinical questions because I think answering these questions will change our clinical practice and hopefully will help our patients. So it's relating to us as dentists on the daily patient's care every day. And as, a, as my role as an academic staff, as an academia, as a researcher, I hope to use my knowledge in research or at least what I don't know to find out what we can help our patients from our perspective to help the dentist as well as to our patients in our daily care to them. So eight is a very good number to Chinese and I'm going to ask eight questions tonight. Number one is how likely will I have a nerve injury in taking this wisdom tooth out? Sounds familiar huh? because uh, this is a question that many patients would love to know. The patients will also ask you, if I have a nerve injury, how likely will I recover? And when will I recover? What are the nerve deficit effects to these patients? These are very important questions because we have to uh, uh, stand in their uh, feeling to know how they feel. And what are the treatment options and outcomes if there are nerve injuries? We're going to ask tonight also, when should a third molar of high nerve injury risk be removed? And how can I predict the risk of nerve injury? And hopefully I'll also give you some technical tips to reduce nerve injury. And of course the hot topic, if you have heard of coronectomy, is cutting the crown of a wisdom tooth out. Is it safe in long term? So let's kick started. As a football fan and also a football player myself, this slide uh, is very important. But we have to wait for some years. Hopefully next year we can watch some real international football. So question one. Our patients ask us, how likely will I have nerve injury in taking this wisdom tooth out? Patients like to ask these questions. Um, they like to have some figures. They want to uh, judge it by themselves even though you may say, well, 5%, 10%, actually to them, it's, it's not quite meaningful because, well, if it happens on them, I tell them if it happens on you, it is 100%. And only I can tell from a very large cohort, very large sample size, this is a figure. So in, if you search the literature, the risk of inferior dental nerve injury, ID nerve injury, is 0 0.26 to 8.4%. And for lingual nerve, it's 0.1% to 22%. To be honest, if you tell this to a patient, this is quite meaningless because like 0 to 22%, it can be anything. If I tell them it's 0 to 100%, it means nothing. So these are not very useful figures, I have to say. And sometimes patients, if you tell this, they will not be very happy. Why are these figures so different? I, we have to understand people do research, they have different uh, methodology, um, they may have uh, different operators levels. Some are done by uh, maybe surgeons, some are done by general dentists, some are by uh, dental students. Uh, they may also have a mixed variety of surgical technique, like a lingual split technique. They may use different instruments. Some of them just report temporary numbness because they may only see the patient once but not following up on them so versus permanent and maybe publication bias if you do something uh, if you find out that well my nerve injury risk is 50 percent you probably won't like to publish it so there may be a publication bias so that's why worldwide figures vary so much and can we have any regional or local data in at least the Asia Pacific region that we can have uh, relevance and reference to? So this is a study that I published uh, in 2010. Uh, this means a lot to me. This is a study in the IJOMS, uh, um, the, the, like the Bible of the MaxFax people. Um, it's a paper 
that I'm very proud of because this is the first study that I got involved when I became a houseman when I first graduated um, under the supervision of Professor Lim Jun. So this is a prospective study. Um, the data were, was collected from 1998 to 2005, and they were all performed under local anesthesia in the Prince Philip Dental Hospital in Hong Kong. It was the largest study in, at, that, at those days, uh, largest prospective study with over 4,000 teeth. And it were mostly done by uh, undergraduates and also junior residents. That means these teeth are more or less a general dental practitioner's level. You can see that most of them are partially erupted. The winter's line um, are like four, six mm. So they are not super deep. They are not those uh, that requires a specialist to operate these uh, day in, day out, third molars that a general dentist will see. So just come quickly to the conclusion, the inferior dental nerve or I inferior avian nerve, that is a more proper term. The deficits at week one, immediate post-op is about 0.35% in our cohorts in this study. And for lingual nerve injury is slightly more, it's about 0.35%. 7% at week one. And we found out the risk factors. What are the risk factors? For ID nerves is mostly the depth of impaction is highly significant. The deeper it is, the more likely it will hurt the nerve. Well, it makes sense because if it's deeper, that means it's closer to the nerve, right? While for lingual nerve, there are other factors like operator's experience. If they are inexperienced, they are more likely to have the lingual nerve deficits, or if they have a if they are distal angularly impacted, this is also highly significant. Why distal angular impaction hurts a lingual nerve? Well, this is easily explained because, for example, like this tooth, and if you recall, the lingual nerve lies very very close to the lingual plates at the distal part of the third molar region. So if the path of withdrawal is going distally and sometimes it may be going distal lingually, then even a temporary scratch or a tension at that area may hurt the nerve. Not to mention it may uh, cut the nerve if the uh, flap is raised too distally. So answering this question quickly, a summary of this, of this question's answer, how likely will I have a nerve injury in taking this wisdom tooth out? If they just want a figure, an overall figure is about 1% for added ID nerve and lingual nerve deficits if they all add together. So patients will know, okay, oh, 1%, the chance is low. But this is a very general figure that, of course, is uh, included all kinds of impactions and death and also. All okay, so here comes the second question. If the patient asks you, if I have a nerve injury, well, you tell them you have 1% chance of having a nerve injury. And he comes, keep asking you, if I have a nerve injury, how likely will I recover? And maybe when will I recover? So the same study also look at the recovery pattern in long term. We talk about at week one, the chance of ID deficit is 0.35%. And for lingual nerve, it's about 0.7%. We also follow them up in long term. What do I mean by long term? It's like two years. For permanent numbness of ID nerve is about 0.12%, while for lingual nerve is about 0.16%. What does it mean? It means extremely, extremely low. If we really look it up in long term, and then uh, actually we look it up to uh, three years, and that is the, um, the good thing about doing research in Hong Kong because we live so close to each other, uh, and the patients can easily travel to a dental hospital to review compared to many centers if they have to drive one hour or even one and a half, two hours to a dental hospital for a, just a checkup, they probably don't want it. So uh, the privilege of Hong Kong is that we can follow up the patients in long term, which is very good for prospective study. For ID nerve deficits, we can see that they heal quickly if they have any. They heal quickly within the first three months. And by three months time, about 50% of them will recover. 
However, if about two years time, you will find out that about two thirds of them will recover. How about after two years, they will not improve anymore. And that is the same as most of the nerve injuries in other part, body parts. For the lingual nerve that is a green line, in six months time, about 60% of them will recover uh, totally. This is total recovery. And by two years, about 70%. And after two years, no matter ID nerves or lingual nerve, they will not recover anymore. Whether they will feel better, whether they will cope with it, that's another issue. But if they are permanent, we say they will be permanent. We know they will be permanent by two years time. But at least we know that in this, in the first three months to six months, they will recover very quickly. And about two thirds of them, at least two thirds of them will, to will be totally recovered. So in my experience, how do we know if they will recover or not? So just a personal experience. So if we have any early sign of recovery, for example, in the first two weeks, you see the patient and they say, well, I have a numbness, but it's getting slightly better, just slightly better. It is some recovery already. So that is a good sign. And that is much better compared to someone who say, I don't feel any recovery at all. And if there's, even if there's a lingual nerve deficit, but there's no taste disturbance, this is also a good sign. If they only have mild to moderate numbness, it is a very good sign. What are the bad signs? What are the factors that you have to worry about? Or you may want to uh, maybe refer to a specialist uh, as soon as possible. So if you deficit, the patients say, oh, I can feel nothing. It's like wood. I, I can't feel my tongue at all. I can't feel my lip at all. That is something you may have to worry. You may suspect there's direct injury. For example, um, the root is touching the nerve for sure. Or you see there is a bleeding when you take out the tooth and it, uh, the area of bleeding is very similar to where you see on the x-ray. That's where the ID nerve is going. Then you, and then uh, coupled with the severe deficit, you may worry that there is a uh, uh, bad injury. If it comes with a dysesthesia, that is pain, not the wound pain, but the pain at the uh, sensory distribution of that nerve, there's also a bad sign because that may imp indicate that a neuroma is forming or is, has been formed. So coming to this question, if I have a nerve injury, how likely will I recover and when? Well, an overall figure is like six, 60 to 70% chance of full recovery. For the 1% of risk, there is a 60 to 70% chance of full recovery. But of course, we have to consider prognostic factor and we have to tell the patient, even if nerve recovery occurs, it occurs very, very slowly. At least it takes months to happen. Coming to the third question, what are the nerve deficit effects to these patients? This sounds quite a, quite a silly question. It's quite a dumb question. Well, we all know what is the nerve deficit effects. From the textbooks, we know the worst can be anesthesia. There's no sensation at all or reduced sensation, that is hypoesthesia. Hyperesthesia is an increased sensation. That's how I tell my patient. Um, uh, if I touch you, like the lip, do you have an increased sensation? Like it is overreacting to the normal sensation that you're supposed to be. That is hyperesthesia. This asthesia is what we mentioned about pain. It's a, not the wound pain, but the pain as the nerve distribution area and it may have loss of taste if a lingual nerve injury. Just a re reminder, it's not from the trigeminal nerve. We all know that the taste comes from the caudal tympani, which is a facial nerve, which goes along the lingual nerve, and we cannot differentiate which one is a lingual nerve and which one is a caudal tympani, even um, from a microscopic perspective. Well, as I told you, I do a lot of orthognathic surgery. And even for those patients, maybe like 80% of them will have at least some temporary numbness in the first two weeks. None of them will complain. And even like if I cut the whole jaw out like this uh, young man, I resect the whole mandible bilaterally because of a huge amoeblastoma. They will not come back and like not happy with the numbness that they are expected. 
So it's interesting. Like I published a paper on orthomnific surgery on the neurosensory deficit with my, one of my trainee uh, quite some years ago. And uh, about 10% of those who underwent orthomnific surgery will have permanent sensory changes. But we encounter zero of them suing us because of this, not because we are from a hospital, from a university, but they are just not cared. They're not worried about it at all. They expected it uh, totally in orthomnific surgery. Uh, compared to uh, wisdom teeth surgery, they may come up with some lawsuit cases, at least we see in the newspaper. So why this neurosensory deficit after third motor surgery for the patients? So it's not, not just on how they feel, not just about the numbness, not just about the pain or hyperesthesia, is why do these deficits will bother them? And if you have encountered them, these, you will see that they will, have, uh, they will be very depressed, they are very unhappy, sometimes angry, and that is totally uh, beyond the amounts of suffering they are having. So first of all, we need to understand this because we want to know better how we feel, how they feel, and we can feel with them empathy. And we have to first understand that sensory deficits is actually as an individual subject, subjective feeling. And a huge factor is psychology. How they perceive this is way more important than how they actually feel. And this is a lot relating to psychology. So an uh, individual with new sensory disturbance, the least we want to know is like the action potential, whether the nerve transmission is working. We do do some like objective sensory measurement, but those are more for research purpose or for interpretation, but they are not really important to the patient. What is important to a patient is how they perceive the sensory disturbance and also how they feel about their quality of life. Are they happy? Are they not happy? And their general well-being. So I did uh, some of these lists as part of my PhD uh, research uh, quite some years ago. We look at the quality of life. If uh, any of you have read any papers relating to quality of life, um, you may feel the same uh, like what I first feel is, is very boring and I don't understand anything about it. Quality of life, what is quality of life? Quality of life to me is playing football, go sailing, have a cup of wine, but in research, there is such a huge area on quality of life. But I try to use this to understand more how the patients feel in the trigeminal neurosensitive deficit. And I use two tools, uh, questionnaires, and you may have heard of this, the SF36 and the OHIP14. Okay, I'm not going to speak alien language. I try to explain this to you. In knowing how the patients feel, how they perceive their life quality, we want to look at First of all, the general health, how they perceive their health in general. And with that, we have some specific validated questionnaire called SF36. And as dentists, we want to know specifically how this uh, problem or how they perceive in their oral cavities problem affects them. So we have a specific questionnaire called OHIP. Okay, so we look at the person in, as a whole the general health, and it's specific. And for us as dentists, we use this because it's relating to oral health. If you are an orthopedic surgeon, you will look at something else. For, for SF36, they have a 36 questions and they have a physical component. Look at like, uh, how do they perceive their general health? Uh, how does this affect their physical functioning? They also has a mental component. How do they feel the emotions, mental health? How, uh, what is, they perceive their own vitality. It's a self-administered uh, questionnaire. They fill it up by themselves. And comes up with two general scores. One is called a PCS, the physical health component scores. One is called a mental health component score. So add up all these questions and come up with a physical component and a mental component. That is very simple. And from zero to 100 scale, the higher, the better general health. The higher, the better they perceive physical, their physical health and thus their general quality of life. When looking at the specific oral health, we have 14 items. This OHIP 14 is already a shortened questionnaire on how disabled on disability they are. 
So from zero, that they never have any physical uh, disability or psychological disability to four very often, and they have 14 items on each of those. So four, four, uh, zero to four on 14 items, you can have a uh, answer from a, a, a score of zero to 56. Of course, because this is on disability, the lower, the better. Makes sense, right? So quickly look at those who have new sensory deficits compared to the control group, which are the normal people. For the general health, remember this is the, uh, the higher, the better. The PCS in the control group is about 51.7 uh, points compared to those with um, uh, study group, it is not significant, okay? If statistics, we want to see 0 0.05, that is significant. Uh, but what we know that in physical disability, they've perceived they are lower, but not physically uh, too, bad, too, too bad. And at least statistically, they are not significant. However, if we look at the mental health component, it changes a lot. And it's 43.6 to 52. What does it mean? It means the, those with permanent nerve injury will feel they are much more worse than those in normal populations. And this is statistical significant. So which means, to a quick summary, they perceive them uh, mentally, at least, their emotion is worse than those um, in the normal uh, people, but they are not actually so much worse because, to be honest, it's only a sensory deficit. For the oral health, again, they perceive they are way worse. Remember, the lower the score, the better. Uh, so the control group is 6.8 compared to 16.4. They are much worse in the study group. So they feel that you can see that they feel, oh, I have pain, I have psychology discomfort. They just don't feel the mouth is right. So they have a much worse oral health related quality of life. So a short conclusion on this, the, they perceive if they have a nerve injury, they perceive they have poorer general health and oral health. Okay, and it affects more on the man mental and psychological side. And I think this can be explained because of the expectation. I'm just coming to take a tooth out. Why do I have to suffer all this? I don't expect this compared to the actual deficit. It's only, to be honest, I tell them before the surgery, of course, it's only if it happens, it's only affecting a small part of your face, which is a very small area or the tongue, which is not the, the big area of your of your face we go on to look at life satisfaction on the same study uh, on different parts we published another paper on the life satisfaction and depression symptoms hopefully this is not too boring but this is something i found it very meaningful so what is life satisfaction there's a definition that i'm not going to go into detail but basically it means how happy you are how happy you are if you are happy you are satisfied then you have a good score we also look at depression. Of course, the diagnosis of depression is made through a structured diagnostic interviews and by a, a suitable personnel, for example, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I'm nobody, but I at least can use some screening to, to know if they are more likely to have depression symptoms. So there are a lot of screening tools for depression. And I'm using uh, two tools for life satisfaction. I'm using one a questionnaire called the uh, satisfaction with life scale but basically it's just ask you can do this on yourself um, are you have a life close to ideal are you satisfied with your with your life if you want to do it uh, again will, will you change anything but basically these are very simple questions we just want to ask them are you happy the higher the happier and for the depression scale as i as i say i can't uh, uh, diagnose depression but i can uh, have a screening tool and I'm using this because this is so simple. Uh, the patient can easily fill this in. And for a score of 16 or above, it was suggested they need further assessment because they are highly likely to have clinical depression. Okay, so 20 questions, very simple questions. And let's look at the results. Life satisfaction for those patients who have new sensory, permanent new sensory deficits. It's the same group of patients like we did with the quality of life they have 19.4 compared to 27, and it's highly significant. What does it mean? 
Well, there's no similar studies, but we compare to like American college students, uh, they are like 25 uh, points. Um, uh, North America is similar to us. They're very happy people, it's 27. But we have no similar studies in dentistry, at least not on the face or not on trigeminal nerve. I can only compare with those who have severe news, um, neurological deficits, for example, spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury. Those are severe injuries of the, uh, of, the, of the nerves. Like those with chronic pain in spinal cord injury, they have 18 point, almost 19. And those with a traumatic brain injury, they have 21. Remember the lower, the worse. And surprisingly in our study, we found we have a very bad group of patients, very bad life satisfaction, which is similar to those who have chronic pain in spinal cord injury, and traumatic brain injury. So this, this finding surprised me because, well, I thought, at least as before, as a dentist, I thought this is only a small little numbness of the face, of the lip. Why does it feel so bad? So at least we know that it can really affect a lot of these patients and we should be more empathetic to their feeling. And for the depression symptoms, the higher, the more depressed they are. So for the study group, for those who have permanent numbness, they have 16.4. Remember, if they are higher than 16, they are more likely uh, to have depression and they need to have further assessment. Compared to control group is 5.7 and it's highly significant again. And we find out those uh, with nerve injury, about half of them will have score over 16. This is very worrying because if they have nerve injury, half of them may develop depression. And the only risk factor I found was age. So if, you, if, the, if the patient is older, 40 years old, I'm, I'm turning 40 next month, if they are older, if you're 40 or above, they have a score 23.4.8 compared to those below age 40, it's less than, it's about 10. This is worrying because if you are removing a wisdom tooth in an older patient, and they are 40 or above, if you have a nerve injury and it becomes permanent, they may develop depression because I felt because they just can't cope with it. Again, for those with higher than 16 points that are like, I assume they have, may have depression, their mean age is 45 years old compared to those with lower than 16, it is about 35 years old. And this is worrying. So this is a very important finding to me because um, we know that these patients have worse life satisfaction and this is so bad that they are comparable to those severe neurological deficits like traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. And they may develop depression symptoms and the older, the higher risk, which means if we have a wisdom tooth, if they have a higher risk, we better remove them earlier. So back to this question, hopefully this research doesn't bore you too much, but this question, this question on what are the nerve deficit effects on patients, to these patients, it's not just what we read from the textbooks. We know that the psychological impact is huge compared to the physical impact. The older, the less likely to cope with the condition. It's all about expectations. And for us as uh, uh, healthcare providers, we should be more empathetic uh, from their perspective. So the next question is, what are the treatment options and outcomes of these nerve injuries? How will we treat as surgeons or what are the available options? Because if it really happens as a dentist, you may first brief them, you may tell them what are the options before you refer to a specialist. So I did a systematic review uh, in, uh, about eight years ago. Um, it's also part of my PhD. And uh, on looking at different um, treatment modalities of nerve injury after third motor surgeries. So this is specifically on third motor surgeries, not on implants, not on phonetics, not on trauma, uh, only on third molars. So we found in this systematic review, there are several possible options like external neurolysis, but I'll explain to you later. Direct suturing, we know we just put them back together or with a conduit, with a tubing in between. There are also reported uh, uh, treatments like acupuncture, low-level lasers, as was also reported. 
So first of all, what is external neurolysis or neurolysis? Well, this is because if there is a mild injury, or at least we believe, we hope it is mild, um, that is some scar tissue sticks the nerve to the periosteum, especially if the lingual nerve, because it lies so close to the periosteum. External neurolysis means we just free the nerve from the adjacent scar tissue. That is called external neurolysis. Direct suturing means we try to reconnect the nerve. But first of all, we have to remember when the nerve is cut, when it's hurt, it will start to repair itself. And sometimes it will form some haphazard or uh, uh, wrong uh, structures. We call it a neuroma that may cause problems like uh, dysesthesia, like pain, like neuropathic pain are usually caused by neuroma. So what we mean by direct suturing in the literature is we cut the neuroma and we re anastomose the nerve together by micro suturing. It's a micro surgical technique. Usually we reconnect the nerves by um, 8 O or 9 O sutures, put six or seven of them uh, epineurally. We may also put a contours. For example, if there is a certain amount of nerve uh, tissue loss that they, we can't bring them together, we may bring in a vein graft or a cortex tubing. Um, and that means there is a gap between, we put something and hopefully the nerve will not grow wild. It will try to grow within that tubing and find each other. For the non-surgical treatments, there's only one study in Chinese. So it's not an uh, English literature. It's only, only one study in Chinese. And it shows that even long-standing deficits can recover. Only one study. For laser, for low-level laser, there's also, there's also only one study and it calls itself a pilot study with a very small sample. And there were no follow-up studies. Even after so many years now, I'm still looking if they are publishing this follow-up study. There's only one pilot study and they stopped doing it. Okay, and they use a laser and they apply for many times uh, for eight weeks. They say they work, but to be honest, I don't trust. I don't think they have good evidence because there is no um, uh, good methodology and there is not enough uh, sample size and power to prove they work. So look at the surgical technique. So it seems like it's only surgical treatment available. Uh, not, to, uh, not saying about medications can control the symptoms, but only the surgical treatment can bring significant uh, improvement. So looking at the lingual nerve injury, we found out that we focus on the direct suturing part because that is most of the uh, surgeons will do, we can find out that most of these will we, we have significant improvement. But you also look at the green part that complete recovery, total recovery is minimal. It's about 5% only. And some of them will have no um, improvement at all. For, in, for ID nerves, it is worse for complete recovery. There's no complete recovery in the systematic review. So I did some myself. Of course, in Hong Kong, we don't do so many. Uh, and the systematic review collected all the cases from all over the world. Of course, we can have a bigger sample. But in Hong Kong, in this, uh, because I have to graduate my PhD in those days, so we only include like uh, 12 cases. Uh, now we do much more. We do um, close to 50 um, or maybe 60 now. But the criteria for myself to offer a surgical repair is moderate to severe numbness, hypoesthesia, or if they have pain or severe hyperesthesia. They are very sensitive, like when they brush, they, they feel like lightning, or they have spontaneous pain. Or for the lingual nerve injury, they have they taste disturbance. Why taste disturbance? As I mentioned, the cauda tympani runs together with the lingual nerve, right? So if the taste disturbance happens, so we suspect the cauda tympani is also cut, that means it's likely to have a total uh, transaction of the nerve, which means a, uh, a, 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 a Sunderland cl class five, a, a new rod mesis, a total uh, transaction of the nerve happens, which means a severe nerve injury. These are criteria I will offer to my patients, i.e. nothing to lose case. The patient can't get worse because I am just being very careful. If they only have mild to moderate numbness without other symptoms, they don't have pain. The surgery itself may bring certain trauma to the nerve and they may be worse. And if it becomes worse, why do they do this treatment? So I choose only the very severe case 
nothing to lose case to operate. So this is how I do my lingual nerve repair. So some surgical photos, uh, we expose a um, third molar region. As you can see, if you can see carefully, the distal part, there's a small defect there. And that is likely to be uh, where the burr has gone through and cut, cutting the lingual nerve. And then I will go into the soft tissue around there to find the nerve. Usually the finding the nerves is the most difficult part. Usually in a case like this nowadays, I do maybe, I spend like two hours for the whole treatment, for the whole surgery. I'll spend maybe one hour or one hour, 15 minutes just to find the nerve. And finding the nerve, sometimes we can see a big neuroma like this. Sometimes if they're totally cut, we can only find the proximal and distal um, nerve endings and try to repair them. So if, I, if we see such a big neuroma, we have to cut it because this neuroma generates wrong nerve impulse and this will cause the dysesthesia or the hyperesthesia because they may amplify a normal impulse and become a, a much a bigger uh, a signal to the brain causing the patient to feel pain. So we have to cut this um, neuroma we have to find the nerve endings again, and we have to freshen up. As you can see that there are all some scar tissue, uh, but we have to freshen until we find some shiny nerve fascicles. And you can see this is like a spaghetti, uh, slightly bigger than spaghetti. And we can then put them together. It's a very difficult surgery. I, uh, I used to do some uh, free flaps, and, uh, but I now use the skill uh, to do my micro uh, a nerve repair. And because we have to, you can see from here, we use like 7-0 or 8-0 sutures uh, to do epineural suturing, maybe about six or even sometimes eight suture around the epineurium to bring them together. Hopefully they will uh, connect with each other again. So this is how a direct nerve repair will do. For inferior inferior nerve or the ID nerve repair, if we really need, really need it, which is um, rare, but it is very, a very difficult procedure. Uh, first, we need to split open the mandible. You can see the mantle nerve in front, but the, it's a third molar injury, and we have to split open the mandible because the nerve runs inside the mandible. We split open the mandible by the surgical split ramus osteotomy that we do every day um, in the orthognathic procedures. We split it open. It is a surgical split so that we have to find the nerve out from this gap and identify the nerve and try to free the nerve. But the nerve is within this canal, so even if we see a neuroma, we cannot move the nerve endings to watch it towards each other. It's unlike a lingual nerve because lingual nerve lies within the soft tissue. So what we have to do, we have to go to the mental nerve. We have to free the nerve from the mental nerve because the mental nerve is, a, is the main trunk of this uh, big nerve, it goes to the incisive nerve, and then uh, most of it branch out like two, this uh, nerve goes like two and branches to the lip to give the lip sensation. So we have to free the whole lingual, uh, the free mental nerve out. Nowadays we use piezo, which is much safer, so that we can, we cut the incisive branch because it only supplies the teeth. They don't, they don't give the uh, cutaneous sensation. As you can see, we have a neuroma at the third molar region, and then we cut the neuroma and try to repair it. This is not very clear because it's very deep inside. So everything is done within this uh, gap, within this surgical split mandible. It's a technically very demanding. If I have to do a lingual nerve repair, I do, I spend, as I say, nowadays I spend two hours. In the old days, I spend three to four hours. But for ID nerve repair, even nowadays, I still have to spare maybe four hours to do this. And after repairing the nerve, I have to plate the mandible again. So it's a much more tedious procedure. We have to find the nerve, we have to take out the nerve, we have to free it from the mental nerve, cut the incisive branch, cut an, an, a neuroma and repair it in a very narrow gap and then put it into good occlusion and plate it back. So it is a very tedious procedure to repair an ID nerve. So what are the outcomes from my study? Uh, this is, again, many, many uh, nines, don't worry. I want you to focus on the green nine, that is the pain. This is a lingual nerve repair. After lingual nerve repair, in the first week, if they have pain, remember a lot of this comes with pain, and that is a big indication for us to operate. They have from 7.2, it's a 0 to 10 VS scale, visualized analog scales. So patients say how bad it is. Zero is normal. 10 is the worst they can imagine. 
Okay, so if they have pain, they may they uh, rate it FH seven, so very painful. After the surgery, immediately they go out down to one. It is average score. A lot of them say I have no more pain because well, it is numb. We cut it, we repair it. But you can see that this pain uh, doesn't come back most of the time. And by one year, most of them, almost all of them, have no pain. And even for those who have a little bit of residual pain, it is minimal, which is very good. I want you to then focus on the, uh, the blue line, which is numbness. So it, from very numb, from eight, gradually recovers to uh, coming back some sensation at one month, and then improve a little bit more by six months, and maybe more or less plateau off at one year. So it improves, but some of sometimes we can only bring improvement, but not total uh, recovery. Okay, and we also look at hyperesthesia. It's also drops significantly, um, and speech and social life impact. How about uh, ID nerves? ID nerves again pain improves drastically. Okay, if they have pain, they will improve a lot. So again, if they have neuropathic pain, instead of having lifelong medication to control the pain, I will offer them surgical treatment. For, for numbness, that is the blue line on top, they also improve, but a lot of them um, may not recover totally, but a lot of them at least will have significant improvement. And same for hyperesthesia, the red line from 7 to 2.5 at one year, which is very significant. And most of these patients uh, found it very, uh, as, uh, very satisfied although they understood well beforehand that it, will, it may not be perfect improvement. So coming to answer this question again, what are the treatment options and outcomes of these nerve injuries? Well, it depends on the symptoms of patients. I think surgical treatment is still the mainstream of treatment. It will bring significant improvement for those uh, carefully selected. And in research, we have a uh, uh, something called functional sensory recovery. So we don't expect them to recover totally. At least functionally, they are uh, recovered. For example, we, this is like uh, a significant improvement in the pain sensation, uh, I mean the pain threshold uh, we test on the objective test. And also the two point, uh, they can feel two points discrimination. But we have to tell our patients it is unlikely to have full recovery. For those who read my Facebook, uh, recently I did a young girl of 17 years old with lingual nerve repair. She says she has full recovery, which is really to my surprise because most of these uh, can't recover totally. And I feel the earlier, the better. I have a patient who I repaired the nerve uh, three years after she came to me because she didn't know that she has uh, she has an option to treat it. She has developed depression, so pain on the lingual nerve injury. Even after the treatment, uh, three, years after, uh, three years after the nerve injury come to see me, I did the repair. I do all the neurosensory tests. It is very well recovered. The patient still feels some pain, and I think the brain starts to interpret it. It is uh, a, a regular sensation to have the pain. So um, the earlier, the better, I felt. Coming to question five, what sh when should a third molar of high nerve injury re risk be removed? If you see a third molar, like the very first case we show in this slide, if they have a very high risk of nerve injury, when should it be removed? We all know about the NICE guideline, the British guideline. Um, they have all these uh, recommendations. They, and in NHS, uh, in UK, they follow this strictly because it's on, not just a guideline for the healthcare profession, it's also a guideline for the healthcare profession in order to know how the resources are distributed. So they will say something they should do, something they should not do, because in the end, if you read a lot of these papers they write, they should justify the nice, it's because of financial considerations. Remember, we used to give uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for those we may worry about an, uh, infective endocarditis. The NICE guideline now say, well, if we want to save some money. We won't, don't want you to waste on the antibiotics. We don't give it anymore, right? NICE guideline on third molars says what? Impacted wisdom teeth free from disease should not be operated because there's no reliable research to justify and there is a risk of surgery. Of course, there's a risk of surgery. 
So wisdom teeth not causing problems should visit dentists for usual checkup. Okay, they not causing problem to the patient. Doesn't mean that there is no problem, isn't it? And only patients with a diseased wisdom teeth should have them removed. So if they don't have a diseased wisdom tooth, they should not be removed. For example, they put up some examples here. Untreatable tooth decay. Well, even if it's treatable, you restore it, you think they won't come back. Or if they have abscess, if you have cysts, tumors, or disease around the tissue, like periconitis, is one indication. So they clearly say, we don't recommend prophylactic removal. So because they have to pay the hospital or the dentist. But consider this, at 20 years old with an asymptomatic, partially erupted eight, like this one, with foot trapping, we don't care about it's close enough or not, we're just foot trapping, partially erupted, but it's not causing any disease, right? You may say, uh, well, you can say, well, there is some bone loss. Yes, but, but according to nice guideline, there's no symptom, you don't, should not remove it. Shall we recommend removal? Shall we refer, or as recommended by NICE, shall we review yearly? We know time is a big factor. And over time, we can have caries, we can have further bone loss, and we, kill, we can kill the bone cells that we can generate uh, more bone. Even after removal of foot molars, we found out there may have residual pockets, isn't it? So ask us ourselves a question when we have to make this decision. If a wisdom tooth has to be removed, when is the best timing? Well, as I say, age is an important factor. Time is a factor because older age increases ID nerve risk in many studies, although not in my studies that I can find, but because most of them are quite young. But in many studies in the world, they found out the older, the higher ID nerve risk. And ID nerve, uh, sorry, the older age may reduce the chance of a good nerve recovery or spontaneous or after the repair. And as we have proved, older age means higher chance of developing depression symptoms if they have a nerve injury. And the older age are longer infection, for sure less periodontal regeneration. And for those you know, you would rather remove wisdom teeth on the 20 years old, but not on the 40 years old like myself. It will be very difficult to remove because the bone is so hard, they start to stick with the, with the bone and it's just so difficult. And if the bone is so hard, and if the nerve is just nearby, what will give way? Of course, it's a nerve will be compressed because the bone is so rigid. So we have a problem, we have a nerve risk, we put it now or we do it in the future. For me, I will say if it is partial eruption or we can prop down to the crown or there is an increased propping depth, the day we see the patient, we should recommend removal, okay? Because this problem will only grow, they will not recover you cannot do scaling and hope it will be better. Or, well, I think this is the only, um, uh, uh, that is the, the best chance to remove is the time when you find this, you should recommend removal. And to be honest, in UK, they start to know that this nice scanner is actually not so nice. They start to say, well, maybe this is, the local media say this is not right. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's good because uh, the patient pays what he uh, gets or, they, they pay out of their own pocket. While in the States, sometimes maybe uh, it's more or less influenced by the insurance plan. In UK, it's uh, affected by the NHS. I used, I used to work there for six months. I work in a very busy uh, Maxfax hospital, uh, and I can, be, I can be doing a one day of GA list of third molars, four, uh, four wisdom teeth uh, in one patient. I have two anesthetists. I have 14 cases. I have to finish the day uh, by 4 p.m. I Every case, I ask them, why do I have to do so many? Because they say every case, the hospital earned 500 pounds or for a GA foot molar case. So they want to cut that cost. So I think what we should do in Asia Pacific, we should offer what we believe is the best for the patients. So back to this question, when should a foot molar of high nerve injury risk be removed? If the tooth has to be removed now or later, the earlier, the better. That's very simple. That's how I teach my students as well. Question six. How can I predict the risk of nerve injury? 
Of course, nowadays we don't have to predict it. We can see it. We have a CT scan or, or combium CT that is a gold standard, but not every clinic is blessed or not every patient can afford an extra maybe uh, 2000 Hong Kong to get a CBCT done. Because the best way may, although we can see, but if we can have a, uh, a cheaper method or simpler method, or sometimes we may miss it. We don't know that there is a high risk. So I did a study uh, on the nerve um, uh, injury risk based only on OPG. I think OPG is the most standardized uh, X-ray, uh, plain X-ray in the oral cavity. And from this, we have a lot of information already. Okay, so we see different kinds of neuro, uh, uh, of uh, radiographic signs. And some signs are more risky. And for example, back to this case, it's actually a case when I was a Jigsteel, I saw my senior doing it. They have to take this tooth out. Not surprisingly, the patient have a numb lip afterwards. Luckily, it's recovered. So very luckily, because we can see that the whole nerve grooved onto uh, hypersemantosis of this uh, tooth. So I published this in Jones in the Journal of Oral Maxillary Surgery uh, many years ago. And looking at the different radiographic signs. Uh, so the, I have two aims. I want to see if, if I take a wisdom tooth from a sign, specific sign, will I see a nerve? At least it means direct contact of the nerve. We don't use CBCT at all in those days. But with this, we can still find a lot of valuable information. And the more important thing is if there is any postoperative ID nerve deficits. It was a prospective uh, cohort study, 178 wisdom teeth. Include those different signs if they have a darkening of roots like this one. We have an abrupt narrowing of the roots. The roots become narrow where the nerve goes. With the loss of the white line of the ID canal, the displacement of the nerve of the canal by the roots or the narrowing of one or both of the canal white line. So these are signs that has been proposed. So we want to see whether these signs are dangerous or not in this cohort. So in this 178 cases, the overall numbness was 5.1%. And about 20% of these with ID nerve exposure presented with ID nerve deficits, which means if you luckily or unluckily see the nerve, you can tell the patient, well, I see the nerve, um, there is a 20% chance of numbness because of this study. So again, not to bore you with all these stats, but this is what we need to do as academics. I want to draw your attention to darkening of roots. Sorry, uh, here. And the displacement of roots. This is showing that if the nerve is touching the roots because I am checking if the nerve is exposed from this radiographic signs. As you can see, darkening of roots and displacement of the ID canal by the roots are the two only are the two signs that will show high risk of high D, ID nerve exposure, not deficit exposure. That means if you see these two signs, likely you they are really touching each other, which means you have a high risk of nerve injury, right? How about real nerve injury? If you have darkening of roots, that is the only sign that shows that you will have a risk of or increased risk of nerve injury compared to the other four signs. So the other four signs, even though they are proposed by other studies, we found only darkening of roots, which means if you see darkening of roots, it is dangerous. If you expose the nerve, you will have a much higher chance of nerve injury compared to those not exposed, fair enough. And if you see the nerve of nerve uh, exposed nerve, you have about eight times the risk of not seeing the nerve of having a risk of deficit. And if you have more than one sign, if you have one sign or more, what are the risks? We found out that two signs or three signs have about 12% in each of nerve risk of nerve injury risk. Four signs is real because the sample size is too small, so we don't take into account. So if you see two signs or three signs of out of the five signs, there is a chance, a higher chance, a higher risk of nerve injury. 
Okay, so if you see darkening of roots or you see two or more radiographic signs. So how can I predict nerve injury uh, risk simply by OPG? Well, if you don't do an OPG, you can do a CPCT. You know that if they're touching or not, but with an OPG, with this information, this is very useful. Beware of darkening of roots or two or more of the five radiographic signs. Okay, this is very simple. This is very user-friendly. I think this is very good piece of information. For me, I, based on this, um, most of the time, I don't need to take a CBCT. I'll explain that in a minute. Question seven, any te technical tips to reduce nerve injury? Okay, how can we reduce nerve injury if we decide to take out the tooth? Just look at this video. This is not me. I just downloaded it from YouTube. This is a Ningo split technique. To say this is uh, impressive because it takes like 30 seconds to take out this tooth. Very nice job. Patient must be very happy. Very small um, exposure of the wound. Hopefully we have uh, less swelling, but this is a very risky procedure because we know that Ningo split have a very high risk of Ningo nerve injury. Ningo split versus buckle approach. The only surgical approach and surgical technique that matters. We know that Ningo split will cause high chance of nerve injury. We are talking about 10 to 20% risk of nerve injury by Ningo split technique. So buckle approach is the way we have been teaching over years uh, in UK or in India, like the video, they're still doing it because they, in the old days, we can understand they don't have very good uh, rotary instruments, but now it is uh, so popular, uh, we have no excuse not using a rotary instrument. But the incision also matters. I have seen a lot of these cases that come to see me because of I need to repair the ningo nerve for them. I can see a scar right um, uh, ningo to the seven, especially sometimes when the seven is ningually tilted, you place an incision mid distal that is already very ningo uh, in relation to the ningo nerve. So remember, remember always cut very buckle and we can always raise a flap ningoly. Of course we've got to the bone and you can see here I don't place a ningo flap retractor. I just put my dial uh, retractor, uh, dial elevator right at the internal bridge because I don't have to go lingo, I just stop there. I don't go beyond the lingo, uh, the, the internal oblique ridge. And I try to stay as buckle as possible. This is called buckle approach. You take out the tooth from buckle. If you can't take it out from buckle, cut it into smaller pieces to take it out from the buckle. Section it, lingo flap or not, there's proven that at least uh, temporary numbness is much more in the ningo flap compared to no ningo flap. So nowadays in the dental school, we tried, uh, we uh, ask our teachers don't teach ningo flap anymore. Uh, it's more on the, for the seniors, uh, uh, trainers who still teach ningo flap, but for, um, for the younger generations, we tell them it's not good to place a ningo flap because if you place in the wrong uh, place, it may, you may have a false uh, protection and you may cut through the ningo plates and cut the nerve because you may be super periosteal. Or if, even if you place it uh, in the correct position, the retraction itself can have some, um, at least some tension or uh, traction to the ningo nerve, which is immediate uh, ningo to the retractor. So the ID nerve is simple. As we say, that it's purely the relation of the roots or the tooth to the nerve itself. We know from, we have a mineral risk, we can see both white lines, they are far from it, at least one to two millimeter away from the canal. Uh, we have some moderate risk of those uh, radiographic signs, but not at the risky radiographic signs, or the high risk one, which are for sure very high chance, like the darkening of roots, as we have mentioned. So we'll talk about the small and moderate risk, because those are the dilemmas, because minimal risk, we don't have to worry, high risk, we have to worry for sure. Small and moderate risk, we may have a chance of preventing by surgical technique not to hurt the nerve. So if we have a case like this, this is a pericarditis, 
uh, some bone loss at the distal of the seven, slightly close to the nerve, it is interrupting the white line, so not a very high risk case, but there is for sure some risk. The easiest way, of course, is to do a longitudinal section. But at the same time, of course, we can do a transfer session, the crown and cut the crown into pieces, take out the crown first and then take out the root. Which one will you prefer? Well, like at this case, we may do it differently. Like this case, of course, the both ways may work. Um, if you ask me if the patient is young, probably I'll do this because this is fast. This is very simple. And I can take it out maybe five to 10 minutes compared to the crown. I may have to do more cuts. Access wise, less, uh, less, less, less good. So I may spend another five minutes doing it. But compared to this one, it is slightly riskier. Why? Because there are two to three radiographic signs here. It interrupts the white line, it displaces the, uh, the, the ID nerve, and it is definitely very close, right? This is moderate risk. There are two signs or above, right? So will I do the same? It's also a mesoangular impaction. Well, if you do this longitudinal section, again, very fast, just one cut, bang, done. You take this distal part out, you flip the mesial part out, finished, right? But if you're doing this, you have a fulcrum and you press onto the apex. And if the root is really touching the nerve, you are compressing the nerve and it is risky. So in this case, a moderate risk case, I will not do this. I will for sure the crown, cut the crown out, cut into smaller pieces, take out the crown first, and then cut the roots into smaller pieces. And then I can flip out the roots one by one because there is minimal apical pressure by doing this. And I like to use this instrument a lot. This is a Kumai scalar because the, uh, the pointy tube here offers the best light force that I can use to flip out this roots that is immediately lying to the, to the, to the nerve. So technical tips, I would say for Ningo nerve, use the buckle approach. Don't use a Ningo spear approach that, and try to stay as buckle as possible. That's the only tips. For ID nerve, case selection is important. For moderate and to low risk to moderate case, section and elevate do matters. So here comes to our last question tonight. Is coronectomy safe in long term? You have heard of it. We cut out only the crown and leaving the root behind. For those who know me, I've been doing it since um, 2004 when I was a houseman. Uh, I started to do this in the old days. This is a taboo to leave anything behind. Now it becomes a routine, but is it safe in long term? So coronectomy is a new method. It's an alternative of third molar surgery that we cut only the crown out. Why? Because the crown caused all the problems of uh, caries, pericarditis, uh, bone loss, but the root is the problem of causing the nerve injury. So the only reason I do coronectomy is because of the nerve. There's no other reasons on top of that. So how do I do it? I raise a, a buckle flap like normal. I don't go a angle flap. I just place it at the internal bridge, expose the crown like this, like normal. Section the crown into at least two pieces, okay? At the CEJ, and I take out only the crown. Try not to mobilize the roots at all. Be very gentle to the uh, roots. And then I trim down, you can see the difference here. I trim down the roots by three to four millimeter below the crestal bone. Sounds easy, right? You don't have to deal with the roots. But actually, it's technically much more challenging because as I always tell my uh, trainees, if you can take out the crown, you can take out anything. If you can take out something very specific, you can take out anything. So it's a matter um, of practice, but it's actually not easier. Don't, the patient will say, oh, you're doing half of the tooth, will you charge me half? I'll say, no, actually, I'll charge you more because it is technically more demanding. And you close it primarily. This is also important. So we first published a randomized clinical trial when, uh, for my master uh, thesis in 2009. It was, a, uh, the, at the time, the biggest randomized trial. And we found that coronectomy can significantly reduce the risk of nerve injury 
uh, in there's only one case of ID nerve, temporary ID nerve deficits compared to 5% of those um, you know, of uh, total removal. So it's proved to be uh, very safe in terms of the nerve. And in short term, uh, there is not, that does not increase pain, dry sockets, or infection rates. It is comparable to the normal wisdom tooth surgery. And in those days, we don't know. We are, I've been seeing the patient almost every week because I was very afraid leaving something behind when I first started. It was uh, scary. And uh, some of the surgeons, senior surgeons, doesn't agree with it. Uh, so in those days, I, I, I'm very careful. So I almost see the patient every week. Then I start to see them every month. And I monitor them very closely for over uh, 170 patients uh, who did chronectomy in, those, in the studies. So the embedded roots tends to migrate forward by a mean of three millimeter in the first two years, okay? But they gradually slows down by one year to two years after the surgery. In those days, we don't know, which I just published it because I have to graduate my master. I did a, a long-term follow-up. Uh, by the way, this study also earned me uh, two uh, prizes um, in research, um, the gold medal in the Hong Kong Academy, Academy of Medicine, and also the Young Researcher Award in the Australian uh, College, uh, which then I become academia partly because of this. So if you don't want to be academia, uh, don't do big research. So, and then we start to monitor it in three years. We tested it step by step. As I say, I was actually not confident. I was scared to have any problem. I have to like, well, tell the patients, if there's any problem, we have to take out the roots because we don't know, we are new. In those days, uh, no one knows what will happen. So in three years, we monitor it. It is still safe. We're happy we publish it. And for my PhD, I look at it um, for five years. We are now almost 15 years now of doing this technique. Uh, but I want to share this uh, five years at least. Uh, uh, we can say it's a medium term or long term. But it's still the longest follow-up in the literature so far. And it's the largest study so far in coronectomy. So in Hong Kong, we are quite famous for coronectomy. Uh, and another good center is doing it is the King's College and also one center in Japan uh, and also maybe some cent uh, one center in the States, but I, think, I don't think they are doing it anymore in terms of research. So we are um, actually very uh, established in research in chronectomy. So in this cohort, we have 612 chronectomies in 450 patients. And we see that uh, in terms of follow-up, uh, some of them follow up to five years. Okay, so let's look at it one by one. So nerve deficits, ID nerve, there's only one case. That is the very first case that we did, uh, the first three or four cases, I can't remember. So only one case, uh, to be honest, that is a wrong selection because the CJ was very close to nerve. But anyway, it recovered. But now after that, we don't have any numbness, even out of these 600 cases, all of these are high, at least have one sign or more of the radiographic sign. So moderate to high risk cases. And lingual nerve, there's no lingual nerve injury. Infection rate of all these 600 cases in the first weeks is only 3%. This is similar to what we have. We don't give any antibiotics afterwards. So 3% is acceptable. Uh, it's actually maybe less than a normal wisdom tooth surgery because the socket is smaller. This one case developed chronic infection at 12 months that we have to go in and remove the roots. Another case at two years, we have to go in and remove the roots. This is a uh, exposed roots at a consequence of continuous migrations. As I say, it will migrate, but some of it, a very small proportion will migrate outside into the oral cavity and we have to remove the roots. So usually I tell a patient, if it really happens, it will be away from the nerve and then we may have to go in a second operation. We do re operate it, uh, remove the roots in 20 of these 612 cases. And one case was because there's a residual crown and we have to go in and reoperate, not removing the roots, but just remove that uh, enamel. We have to trim the exposed root edge in one case. There are two cases, as I say, with chronic infection, we have to go in and remove the roots. There's root exposure in 13 cases. Some patients just say, oh, I have weight pain. I felt it's weird. I want to remove it. But radiographically, we don't find anything abnormal. But the patient wants it, we did it. So there are two cases. And one uh, 
because the uh, subsequent we have an orthognathic surgery, we need to do a surgical split, we have to remove the roots. So only like maybe 15, 17 cases are real problem from the roots, right? So this was the case that we have to go in and cut the uh, residual crown. So if you are doing it, remember, we should leave no enamel because the bone won't stick to enamel. It will stick to dentine because of the uh, periodontium, but not enamel. So none of these develop pathology. And even for these 12 cases, we have to go in and remove uh, the roots. None of these, out of these 600 ish cases, none of these have ID nerve deficits because of the reoperation. So let's have a look of one uh, iconic case. So first week, we removed the crown. This uh, is for sure darkening of roots, very high nerve risk. So we remove only, we do a coronectomy with only the crown, trim it down. Six months, you can see it gradually moves up. Sometimes we see an apical, apical radiolucency. It's not because the, uh, the pop is dead and causing radical radiolucency. I felt because it, when it migrates, the bone underneath is not formed yet. So there's an apical radiolucency, not a pathology. So we leave it. And you can see gradually it will slow down. It moves very fast in the first six months. It slows down in the another six months. And the apical radiolucency, the bone grow, and also the top bone also grew. So the, the uh, roots will stop migrating very soon. 12 months, uh, sorry, 24 months, two years, it's more or less like one year. 36 months, three years time, it is similar. Same for five years, it stays there, wrapped up by bone, there's no uh, pathology around it, and it stays there forever, and we save the nerve. So this was um, the root migration pattern. As you can see that they migrate very fast in the first six months and slows down. Uh, one year and two years, and most of them don't migrate anymore um, after two years, and they are more or less stable. For those who roots that will migrate, most of them will migrate in the six months, then most of them, 90%, and only about 1% of them may go on to migrate uh, by serial and analysis of these OPGs. Only 1% may still migrate, and if they really come out, they don't bring the nerve with them, and we can go in and take out the nerve as a reoperation. Of course, there is another surgery, but at least the risk of nerve injury is much less. So be careful. Coronectomy is more technically demanding. It is not easier. It is actually more difficult. And to me, it's not an excuse of an unplanned root retention. Okay, if we can't take out the roots, it's, I, I won't say tell the patient, well, because I'm doing a coronectomy. I think this is uh, not good. Case selection is critical. So is coronectomy safe in long term? I would say yes, in terms of nerve, in terms of uh, infection, everything, they are much safer. They have minimal morbidities, and about 3% of the roots may erupt and need a second operation, and almost no nerve injury uh, with this technique, apart from the one that I think is a wrong case selection. So my uh, uh, algorithm on this is for minimal risk, for sure, I don't give them any options of colonectomy. I just say total removal. For small and moderate risk, I will still suggest total removal, mostly. What about the risk? Unless the patient is a singer. I have some patients who are artists who sings, or they use, uh, they, they play uh, maybe pipe instruments, instruments uh, of like oboe. I have an oboe player, a professional oboe player. Patients, I say, well, your risk is not my, it's not the same as what I perceive a risk. So I, your risk is much important because even if 0.01%, if you lose that sensation, it damages your career. So it's most of this, I will say, I'll just remove the roots totally, the tooth totally. And one about the risk, of course. And for the high risk cases, I will offer them coronectomy as my first line. I will, uh, most of them, I will say, well, this is the safest way unless they are so against coronectomy or if they have other reasons, for example, if they have a, a decay of the tooth that we can't do coronectomy, then no choice, you have to take the risk. But if I have a choice, I would say coronectomy for you because of your high risk. So the take home message tonight is that nerve injury after third molar surgery is a significant complication to the patients that we know. 
There are treatments available, but we have our limitations. Prevention is always better than cure, and radiographic signs, even for plain X-ray, are very useful for the risk and identification. And we have to select the case carefully, and the specific technique will help. And coronectomy has proved to be an alternative in high-risk cases. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, for those overseas participants, I hope to meet you one day in Hong Kong after this pandemic. Thank you. Have you done? Uh, yes, yes. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Mike, for the quite extended lecture and very informative uh, experience. And so you back up your, your lecture with uh, some uh, research that you showed. I think uh, we have about three or four questions uh, in the chat. Maybe I can start with the first one from, uh, I think, Ashad Malik. Uh, he said that, uh, uh, evaluation, uh, proper evaluation of difficulty indexes reduces the incidence of nerve injury. Safe approach in wisdom to injury in microsomia, microglossia, micronesia, and bulky chicks. Ajarilu, what is your experience? Uh, can you repeat, repeat that question again? Sorry. Uh, is it that is it proper evaluation uh, yeah. oh, okay. of okay. reduces the incidence of nerve injury? Safe approach in wisdom to injury in microsomia, microglossia, micronesia, bulky chicks. Uh, generally mm. over white experience. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, I think uh, in the, uh, if you read the textbooks, uh, if you use UK ones, it's, we use the Winters line. Uh, the American books use the Perrin Gregory, uh, taking into account of how deep it is in the AP direction. But they are still assessing the uh, bony structures, isn't it? Uh, the good, good point here is we don't assess the soft tissue very much. And to be honest, there's no proper studies or at least no proper uh, uh, recognized classifications that assess the soft tissue. So sometimes you have to really talk to a patient or you have to assess it yourself. Uh, after all, is the access, how you can access the tooth to take it out in wisdom tooth surgery. So for example, for the same radiograph, if you have a very small mouth or a very deep, a very long jaw and the mouth is not opening very, very wide, etc., your access to that tooth will be very difficult, isn't it? So your angulation to make your proper cut will be very much compromised if you have all this like um, a small mouth or a big tongue in a way, or even gag reflex, bulky cheeks, fat patients, these are factors that is underreported. So uh, what I can recommend is, um, well, tell the patients, expect the time, or if you have the privilege to use uh, China and the CCR, sometimes this may help you uh, to do a, a easier surgery. But uh, after all, um, what I recommend is see the patient first, don't commit your time and arrange another appointment. Uh, different patients, different difficulty needs different uh, time. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, my, my, I think the next question is from Anthony. Uh, is it, are there any risks of infection of the palpal space from coronectomy? Uh, sorry, the risk of risk? infection. Uh, not from our uh, study. We do a lot of study, but um, of course I, I did like two or three cases. I didn't publish this data but I take out the roots in those uh, 20 cases that I have to uh, reoperate and take out the roots. And I take the roots to send for histology. And surprisingly, they found that they are viable purple tissue of the residual roots after coronectomy, after like two years after coronectomy. So actually there are some published um, uh, animal studies in dogs in the 70s. They do coronectomy, they cut the crown and just leave it there. And they found out, they take out the roots, they found out that the blood vessel will grow into the purple cavity. So there's no purple necrosis that most people first worried when we proposed coronectomy. There's no purple necrosis happening because the blood supply from the surrounding tissue will grow into the purple uh, cavity. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Doc, uh, for the uh, answer. Now, I think Professor Ashad Malik has uh, raised his hand. Maybe we give some opportunity live question from Professor Ashad Malik. I know there's uh, several questions on the chat room, but since uh, I want to say a live, live question from Professor Ashad Malik. Okay. Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I, and uh, it's a wonderful presentation. I'm Professor Ashad Malika. Actually, I'm maxillofacial surgeon and uh, I'm Dean of uh, Dental College as well. Uh, it's a wonderful to see. So, chronectomy uh, is a wonderful process. Uh, actually, you see in concretions or uh, in uh, hypercementosis or in dilaceration, these are the events when you, you cannot uh, go ahead for the removal of uh, uh, infection at all sometimes. Uh, so it is a wonderful approach to have the coronary. Your name is, uh, uh, it is before me that I have seen uh, your name many times with reference to coronectomy. And I'm very pleased that I am before you. Uh, my question is that can we do removal of the pulp and uh, have the gutta percha placement there that it will be more safer as compared to leaving the vital pulp there it may be have infection during your process or may get infected thank you professor malik uh, this question is uh, uh, very good uh, and there have been people proposing it uh, before and there has been studies uh, that people do coronectomy and do root canal filling into the roots and what they found is there are actually more problem. There will be infection afterwards if you try to fill up the roots. Compared to our samples that we don't do anything, we just cut it, we don't try not to touch the purple cavity. We just remove the uh, tooth structure nearby to make it like lower than the bone because we expect it to migrate up. So we just cut it so that it, when it migrates, it won't go up to the cavity, oral cavity immediately. So uh, we just don't touch the, uh, the purple tissue and we found no problem. Compared to that study, if you may search, if they try to fill it, there are much higher risk of infection. I guess because if you use scatter pressure and it's exposed to an environment, there is a chance of foreign body reaction or maybe uh, antimicrobial may live on this foreign body and cause an infection itself. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Thank okay. you. Uh, I think uh, it's getting late. I just want to get seven more questions on Mike. I think I just yep. like to see the, the, um, maybe the, the rest, maybe I might contact you personally. But I think there's quite uh, one question that I quite interests me is this. Do you, the last one from Wendy, do you prescribe antibiotic routinely after surgical removal of that molar? That's a very good question. Um, to be honest, uh, it depends. Uh, if there is existing infection, uh, of course, there is a need. Uh, in, and when I was working in UK, they prescribe it as a routine and they give augmentin as a routine. Now it depends if I can do it relatively um, straightforward cases or I have minimal manipulation of the soft tissue, I probably won't give, but if like if it's a deep impaction, if I have to manipulate the soft tissue a lot, uh, if I have to do primary closure, then there may have a hematoma and the germs may grow on this hematoma and cause an infection. Then I may give prophylactic in, uh, antibiotics. So it all depends on the scenario. But I think overall the risk of infection is about 5% in the literature. So it, this 5% depending uh, whether the patient can take this 5%. If the patient is a, for example, VIP, um, a, a very important person or may have a, something very important to do in the coming week, you don't want to risk infection, you give antibiotics. If there's someone that is easily available uh, to come back to see you anytime and uh, the risk you think is relatively less, you are not removing it when it is very infected, um, then I think Cohexidine mulberries itself, a good cleaning, salt water will serve the purpose already. All right, thank you for a very precise answer, uh, Mike. So I think uh, I think uh, we'll stop now because it's almost all getting late now, 11, 11 plus 30. And thank you very much on behalf of the ICD section 15.
Uraj, thank you for sharing your experience. I'm sorry I was not uh, able to ask a few other questions. Maybe some of the time we can post it to you, the question by a few of our audience tonight. By the way, yeah, thank you. Feel free you. to email me. Uh, maybe uh, the, I think you uh, very much appreciate your your experience, uh, your sharing experience with uh, our our audience tonight. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. We see you sometime in the future, maybe if it's time. Okay, face to face. Right. Okay, bye. bye. Good night. <clears throat> bye. Good night. Good night. Uh, again, um, I just uh, for like to turn back next week. We have another speaker from Bangladesh. Uh, from Motil Rahman, Professor Motil Rahman, uh, she going to talk about oral and head and neck cancer during pandemic 19 situation. So, uh, welcome all of you to come again to be with us next Wednesday, same time, uh, same time with uh, Professor Motil Rahman. Uh, he's also the region of Bangladesh. So, I uh, hope uh, we can meet. Uh, you can spend some time next week, same time, with uh, Professor Rahman. Okay, thank you and bye and um, good night and uh, have a good time and we we'll see you again uh, next week and thank you again for joining us this week. Uh, bye. <clears throat> bye bye. <clears throat> <clears throat>